My name is David Gagnon. I'm the executive director of the Mariah Mitchell Association and welcome one and all making it out here and finding that small door on the side of a building without any signage. So you've already passed the Mariah Mitchell test, I would say. So 170 years ago, on October 1st of this year, on Nantucket, Mariah Mitchell discovered a previously unidentified comet. She understood that this comet, C1847T1, later to be popularly named Miss Mitchell's Comet, was a new discovery. She knew this to be true. Why? Because she had carefully and systematically studied the night skies over Nantucket for many years. Around a year after Mariah's significant discovery, she received a gold medal from King Frederick VI of Denmark, and that would change the trajectory of her life and the lives of many generations to come, including myself. Mariah's work, the result of careful study, patience, and tenacity, is reflected in the spirit of the Mariah Mitchell Association today. Her unshakable belief is that learning by doing is at the heart of success in the sciences and other disciplines. As a result of our work today, multitudes of children and adults can discover this unique island's natural wonders, explore the beautiful skies, you'll see in a minute, <laughs> and experience our aquarium, natural science museum, and of course the historic Mariah Mitchell House every summer. Many of you know something about the extraordinary accomplishments of Mariah Mitchell. Today it is our hope that you will grow to understand Mariah, the person, and as such understand her more completely. Her legacy is a profound gift to the people of Nantucket, the students that work at the association, islanders that live here year round, our visitors from all over the world. The long lasting and unshakable support and investment from people like you enable us to continue to offer these life changing experiences. We owe a significant debt of gratitude to our partner in this endeavor, the Dreamland, of course, Joe Hale and theater director Laura Gallagher Byrne, who's probably, there you are, right there, thank you. And also stage manager, Nicole LeBlanc. She's an uh, intern from the Nantucket High School. We're really pleased with her work tonight. I would like to offer a special tribute to Barbara Duffy, who could not be here tonight, for her devotion to the legacy of Mariah Mitchell and for making Mariah's words more accessible through this compilation of her letters and journals. And now I'd like to introduce Mariah Mitchell. Welcome, Mariah. Welcome to you. Thank you. As you may recall, Mariah Mitchell was born in 1818 on Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, the third of 10 children. Her father was an astronomer whom she began to help when she was 12 years old. At 18, she became the first librarian of the Nantucket Athenaeum, where she served for 20 years. This position, combined with computing for the American Nautical Almanac, made her financially independent. At 45, she became professor of astronomy at Vassar College. In 1854, at 36, she began a journal, and through it and her many letters and scientific notes, we meet her. Whenever she could, she would go up to the rooftop observatory her father had set up and sweep the sky. <laughs> March 2nd. I sweat last night two hours by three periods. It was a grand night. Not a breath of air, not a fringe of a cloud, all clear, all beautiful. I really enjoy that kind of work, but my back soon becomes tired long before the cold chills me. I saw two nebulae and Leo, with which I was not familiar. And that repaid me for my time. I'm always the better for open air breathing and was certainly meant for the wandering life of the Indian. <laughs> April 10th. 
one gets attached, if the, if the term may be used, to certain midnight apparitions. The aurora is always a pleasant companion. A meteor seems to come like a messenger from departed spirits, and even the blossoming of the trees in the moonlight becomes a sight looked for with pleasure. And from astronomy, there is the same enjoyment as a night upon the housetops with the stars, and as in the midst of other grand scenery. There is the same subdued quiet and grateful sensuousness, calm to the troubled spirit, and a hope to the desponding. The glaring eyes of a cat who nightly visited me were at one time very annoying. And a man who climbed a tree and spoke to me in the quietness of the small hours fairly shook not only my equanimity, but the pencil which I held in my hands. He was quite innocent of any attempt to do me harm, but he gave me a dreadful fright. For spiders and bugs, which summer in my observatory house, I have rather an attachment. But they must not crawl over my recording pages. <laughs> Rats are my abhorrence, and I learned with pleasure that some poison had been placed under the transit house. Mariah discovered a telescopic comet on October 1st, 1847. Her father joined her at the telescope and declared that the object was indeed a comet. And convinced, he wrote to William Bond, director of the Harvard College Observatory. President Edward Everett, Everett of Harvard took up the cause, applying for the gold medal to be awarded by the King of Denmark for the discovery of a comet using a telescope. President Everett wrote to authorities in Denmark as follows. I have received information in reference to the comment of October, which leads me to hope that you may feel it in your power to award the medal to Miss Mariah Mitchell. Miss Mitchell saw the comet at half past 10 o'clock on the evening of October 1st. Her father, a skillful astronomer, made an entry in his journal to that effect. On the third day of October, he wrote a letter to Mr. Bond, the director of our observatory, announcing the discovery. The letter was dispatched the following day, being the first post day after the discovery of the comet. This letter I transmit to you, together with letters from Mr. Mitchell and Mr. Bond to myself. Nantucket as you are probably aware, is a small, secluded island lying off the extreme point of the coast of Massachusetts. Mr. Mitchell is a member of the Executive Council of Massachusetts and a most reputable person. As the claimant, a young lady of great diffidence, the place a retired island, remote from all the high roads of communication. As the conditions have not been well understood in this country, and especially as there was a substantial compliance with them, I hope His Majesty may think Miss Mariah Mitchell entitled to the medal. I was awarded the medal in 1849. Attention and honors ensued. In 1848, I was made a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 1855, the first woman member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's really amusing to find oneself lionized in a city where one has visited quiet, quietly for years, to see the door of fashionable man open wide to receive you, <laughs> which never opened before. I suspect that the whole core of science laughs in its sleeve at the farce. We are feted and complimented to the top of our bent. Though complimenter and complimented must feel that it is only a sort of theatrical performance for a few days and over, 
One does enjoy acting the part of greatness for a while. <laughs> the descent into a commoner was rather rapid. I went along to Boston after three days at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Philadelphia. And when I reached out my free ticket, the conductor read it through and reached it back, saying in a gruff tone, it's worth nothing. A dollar and a quarter to Boston. <laughs> Think what a downfall. The night before, and one blast upon my bugle horn was worth a hundred men. Now one man alone was my dependence. And that man looked very much instead to put me out of the car for attempting to pass a ticket that in his eyes was valueless. Of course, I took it quietly. <laughs> and paid them money. <clears throat> Deacon Greeley urged my going to Boston and giving some lectures to get money. I told him I couldn't think of it just now as I wanted to go to Europe. On what money, said he. What I have earned, I replied. Bless me, said he. Am I talking to a capitalist? <laughs> October 20th, 1856. Mr. E.G. Kelly, will you say to the trustees of the Athenaeum that I wish to resign my position as librarian on the 1st of November, up to which time I have supplied the place? Having had this step in view for some years, I have caused to be prepared a catalog of the books in the order in which they stand, which may be found in two bound volumes. Yours. Mariah Mitchell. My travels begin. I became governess to Prudence Swift, the daughter of H.K. Swift, a Chicago banker. Spring 1857. Traveling to pick up Prudy, I found from Nantucket to Chicago more attention than I desired. I was invariably offered the seat near the window that I might lean against the partition when I sat with a gentleman, and one gentleman threw his shawl across my knees to keep me warm. I was suffering with heat at the time. <laughs> <laughs> one peculiarity in traveling from east to west is that you lose the old men. In the cars in New England, you see white-headed men. And I kept one in the train up to New York and one of grayish tinted hair as far as Erie. But after Cleveland, no man was over 40 years old. In July, with Prudy, Mariah set sail on her long hoped for trip to Europe. She took letters of introduction from Joseph Henry, director of the Smithsonian, the bonds of the Harvard Observatory, Edward Everett, president of Harvard, and A.S. Beish, superintendent of the Coastal Service. <coughs> August 2nd. We have landed in Liverpool, August 5th. I sent my letter to Mr. Nathaniel Hawthorne. From all that I had heard of Mr. Hawthorne's shyness, I thought it doubtful that he would call and I was therefore much pleased when his card was sent in this morning. He was more chatty than I had expected. <laughs> not any more diffident and not any less awkward. He remained about five minutes, during which time he took his hat from the table and put it back once a minute, brushing it each time. The engravings in the books are much like him. He's not handsome, but he looks as the author of his works should look. A little strange and odd, as if he has large, bluish-gray eyes. His hair stands out on each side so much that one's thoughts naturally turn to combs and hairbrushes and toilet ceremonies as one looks at him. On to London. <laughs> the mere idea.
idea that we were in London kept us from sleeping. Westminster Abbey interested me more than I had expected. I stepped reverently when I found I was standing on the stone which covers the remains of Dr. Johnson. Garrick lies by the side of Johnson. You are continually misled unless you refer it every minute to your guidebook. And to go through Europe reading a guidebook which you can read at home seems to be a waste of time. As I stepped aside, I found I had been standing upon a slab marked Isaac Newton, beneath which the great man's remains lie. The four great men whose haunts I mean to seek and on whose footprints I mean to stand, Newton, Shakespeare, Milton, and Johnson. September 3rd, last night we were at the opera. The opera fatigued me, as my music always does. <laughs> I tired my eyes and ears in the vain effort to appreciate it. <laughs> October 1st, 1857, Abbotsford, Scotland. I sat down in the chair which Sir Walter Scott had occupied. And I almost felt his presence. His power I had known nearly all my life. It was rather a sad visit, as all such visits must be. I had half a, a mind to sit down and cry, perhaps because the wizard was dead, perhaps because I was a little homesick. Sir George B. Airy, the astronomer royal for England, and his wife became friends and were very kind to me. We were invited several times to Greenwich, staying on occasion overnight in the observatory. The dinner party on October 23rd was is, is noteworthy. We were to meet Professor Frederick Struva, director of the Imperial Observatory at Polkova in Russia with his son. Herr Struve is a magnificent-looking fellow. When he is introduced to anyone, he thrusts both his hands into the pockets of his pantaloons and bows. <laughs> However, the old gentleman did me the honor to shake hands with me, and when I told him that I brought a letter to him from a friend in America, he said, it is quite unnecessary. I know you without. Mrs. Airy told me that she should arrange the order of the guests at table to please herself, that properly all the married ladies should precede me, but that I was really to go out first with Mr. Airy. We also met Sir Edward Sabine, president of the Royal Society and others. <gasps> General Sabine is a small man, smiles readily, is chatty and sociable. Mrs. Sabine is short, plain, very agreeable, and not a bit of a blue stocking. Professor Powell is fat and lazy looking. Mrs. Powell was overdressed. Mrs. Sabine underdressed. General Sabine, not knowing it was an occasion, wore an old coat. In Cambridge, we met Dr. William Hewell, master of Trinity College. He asked us at once to lunch. He chatted freely with Mrs. Airy and occasionally turned to me, but I was not pleased when at one of these times he said, go the whole hog, as you say in America. At six and a half, we went to the lodge to dine. We were a little late, and the servant was in a great hurry to announce us, but I made him wait till my gloves were on, though not buttoned. Dinner was soon announced, and I had the honor of being handed down by the master. Dr. Hewell spoke to me of the American poets, and to my amusement declared Emerson to be a copyist of Carlyle in his prose, and of Tennyson in his poems. He 
He said Longfellow was the most popular poet in the English language, for he was more easily understood than Tennyson. He was quite shocked at my preferring Mrs. Browning to Mrs. Hemans, and said she was so coarse in Aurora Lee as to be disgusting. I told him we had outgrown Mrs. Hemans, and he asked me if we had outgrown Homer, to which I replied that they were not similar cases. I had been told that the English do not consider Irving as an, as an American, but I was not pre prepared to hear the question of a lady, do you consider Irving as belonging to your country? Certainly. I replied, he was born and brought up there. Yes, but his father was born in Scotland. All our grandfathers were born in England or Scotland, I replied. Altogether, there was a tone of satire in Dr. Hewell's remarks, which I did not think amiable. There was, as there is very commonly in English society, some dresses too low for my taste. And the wine drinking was so universal so that I had to make a special point of getting a glass of water and was afraid I might drink all there was on the table. When Prudy's father became bankrupt in the 1857 panic, she returned home. Mariah determined to remain in Europe. In November, she wrote, I am hoping to get to Paris next week. I shall wait no longer for an escort. I have had just what I intended in England as to society. December 2nd, 1857. <sighs> I spent all of yesterday in seeing the outside of Paris. First in a carriage, then on foot, then in carriage again. From 10 in the morning till 10 at night, I was sightseeing. <clears throat> it is really a magnificent city. December 3rd, no Frenchman or woman makes way for you in the street. It is not their business. You must move away from the loaf of bread on the man's head, a yard or two long, or it will hit yours as it passes. Still, the French have a charm especially those of the lower classes, in their good nature. December 9th. I sent my letters to Monsieur Le Verrier, director of the Paris Observatory, and Madame Le Verrier, and asked when I might call. They gave me eight o'clock in the evening. As I had, among other charges made to me, been told not to offer to shake hands, I kept my hand to myself. The Le Verrier speak English about as well as I do French. We had a very awkward time of it. December 15th. I went to Le Verrier's again last evening by special invitation. Monsieur was more sociable than before and yelled out to me in French as though I were deaf. About 10 o'clock, Monsieur Le Verrier asked me to go into the observatory after my walk, I came back to the drawing room and they gave me a cup of tea. I took two swallows and I thought it was best to take no more if I was to get home straight. <laughs> it tasted like rum and I suppose had brandy in it. There was no taste of tea. <laughs> I came back in a cab for miles alone, but had no fear, for I know there were soldiers at every turn. The city is as quiet as Nantucket. January 13th. I left Paris en route to Rome in the company of Nathaniel Hawthorne and his family. <coughs> He is reported to say about me, my wonder is that a person evidently so able to take care of herself should care about having an escort. 
January 24th, 1858, I am in Rome. I have been here four days, and already I feel that I would rather have that four days in Rome than all the other days on my travels. I have been uncomfortable, cold, tired, and subjected to all the evils of traveling, but for all that, I would not have missed the sort of realization that I have of the existence of the past of great glory if I must have a thousand times the discomfort. January 31st. I went to French theater in the evening, which shows that I can relax in my morals like others when I am away from home. <laughs> March 3rd, I am working to see the observatory of the Roman College, the Vatican Observatory, but it is a Jesuitical institution and they say only the special permission of the Pope can affect it. I was ignorant enough of the ways of all papal institutions and indeed of all Italy to ask if I might visit the observatory. I remember that the days of Galileo were days of two centuries since. I did not know that my heretic feet must not enter the sanctuary, that my woman's robe must not brush the seats of learning. I was told that Mrs. Somerville, the most learned woman in all Europe, had been denied admission and that the daughter of Sir John Herschel, England's foremost naturalist, in spite of English rank, was at the very time in Rome and could not enter an observatory, which was at the same time a monastery. <sighs> if I had before been mildly desirous of visiting the observatory, I was now intensely anxious. On March 2nd, Permission arrived. There had been red tape and I had not seen it. April 12th, we left Rome, not with tearful eyes as everyone had told me I must, but with a laugh and a jest and a vetturino, crowded, full of trunks and bags and human beings. Then April 16th, Perugia, April 19th, Florence, April 29th, Venice, April 30th, Trieste, May 2nd, Vienna, my dear father, I am in a great hurry to get home, but not a bit homesick. May 4th, Berlin. So far, I feel that nothing is easier than to travel in Europe alone. When I get out of the cars, I rush up to a soldier and ask, in German, what shall I do? And he sends me to a hackman and the hackman gives me a number and tells me to call a porter and so on. Frequently, I have consulted several soldiers before I get on much, as I never hesitate to do it. Indeed, an armed man is getting to be my delight. Shall come home decidedly in favor of a standing army. June 8th. As we pass within 30 miles of Nantucket, I ask the captain to put me ashore, to which he replies that I ought not to live there if I can't go the long way around by New York. <laughs> <laughs> Nantucket, January 4th, 1861. If the holidays are sad days to you, they are no less so to me. My mother is increasingly feeble, and the dread of loss is as great a source of suffering as loss itself. I have abandoned my pleasant sitting room and spend my time in her room, studying in a corner, when I am enough easy in mind to touch a book at all, figuring, when it is a duty to figure. There is the painful peculiarity in her illness of occasional wandering of the mind. We try to be cheerful and to keep up her spirits, 
and I go out sometimes in the evening, but we do not leave her alone a minute. Oh, what a sad period it is for the whole country. I really never thought that these things could get so far. We may as well meet the trouble now as postpone it for a few years. I hope we may not have civil war. Our winter is duller than usual. If there is any society, I am wholly out of it. So much so that as I look around on audience at a concert, it's almost an assemblage of strangers. Mrs. Mitchell died July 7, 1861. Mariah and her father moved to Lynn, Massachusetts. They took their telescopes, including her new one, purchased with a gift of money from the Women of America organization. The following summer, she received this letter. August 21st, 1862. Miss Mariah Mitchell, respected friend. Let me briefly explain the occasion of my writing as the intimate confidential friend of Mr. Vassar, the generous founder of Vassar Female College. I have been designated by him to put myself in communication with yourself in regard to the interest of that institution. Rufus Babcock, trustee. After meeting with Mariah, Babcock wrote, September 8th, 1862, Honorable Mr. Vassar, I will send to you a formal report addressed to you for the executive committee, if they care to look at it, in regard to my visits to Miss Mariah Mitchell. She is by far the most accomplished astronomer of her sex in the world, I have no doubt and but few of our manly sort are anywhere near her equal in her loved and chosen pursuits. She has, moreover, a wealth of culture I was by no means prepared to expect. She has traveled a year in Europe with the best facilities of access to all the learned, and yet, with all this refineness, she is as simple-minded and humble as a child. With all the rest, Miss Mariah is not such a poor, miserable blue stocking as to know nothing else but astronomy. The day I spent with her and her father, their domestic was absent, and Mariah prepared dinner and presided in all the housewifery of their cozy establishment without parade and without any apparent deficiencies. In her astronomical observatory, fitted up at the back end of her garden, she's still more at home, handling her long and well-adjusted telescope with masterful ease, accuracy, and success. She furnishes all the astronomical calculations for the nautical almanac at the stipulated pay of $500 a year. This she can probably take with her to Poughkeepsie if we shall be so fortunate as to secure her services. Rufus Babcock. <clears throat> October 29th, 1862. Miss Mariah Mitchell. Dear Madam, I have on several occasions had the pleasure to hear your name mentioned at the annual meetings of the Board of Trustees of Vassar Female College as the most suitable person to fill the important office of professorship of astronomy. I am, dear madam, yours very respectfully, Matthew Vassar. Mariah wrote to Rufus Babcock, what I said to you about women as astronomical observers was probably this. The perceptive faculties of women being more acute than those of men, she would perceive the size, form, and color of objects more readily and would catch an impression more quickly. Then, the training of girls, bad as it is, leads them to develop these faculties. The fine needlework and the embroidery teach them to measure small spaces. 
The same delicacy of eye and touch is needed to bisect the image of a star by a spider's web as to pierce delicate muslin with a fine needle. The small fingers too come into play with a better adaptation to delicate micrometric screws. A girl's power of steady endurance of monotonous routine is great. The girl who sits for two hours at the piano might just as well take two hours at the telescope. I believe it would be better for the health even that a girl should spend some time in the open air in the evening. I think as observers in any department of natural science, they would be excellent. I do not believe, however, that when it comes to the most profound investigations of the problems of the universe, they would be found very good philosophers. But how few men are? Mm -hmm. Mariah Mitchell. Poughkeepsie, New York, April 14th, 1863. Ms. Mitchell, I have the pleasure in apprising you that upon your compliance with certain permanent and general conditions and regulations established by the trustees of Vassar Female College, you are elected professor of astronomy in this college. C. Swan, secretary. And so Mariah and her father moved to Vassar College. She wrote, Vassar has brought together a mass of heterogeneous material. A small jostling has been felt, but the president has oiled the rough places and we have slid over them. Miss Lyman, the principal, is a bigot, but a very sincere one. She <laughs> is very kind to me, but had we lived in the colonial days of Massachusetts, and had she been a power, she would have burned me at the stake for heresy. <laughs> Yesterday, the rush began. One woman, who seemed to be a bright woman, got me by the button and held me a long time. She wanted this, that, and the other impracticable thing for the girl. She wiped her weeping eyes and said, mm -hmm. and Miss Mitchell, <laughs> Will you ask Miss Lyman to please insist that my daughter shall curl her hair? <laughs> she wanted to know who would work some buttonholes in her daughter's dress. I broke down and laughed. The mother took it very good-naturedly. <laughs> and it all ended in her inviting me to make her a visit. I never look upon the mass of girls going into our dining room or chapel without feeling their nobility, the sovereignty of their pure spirit. December 19, 1865, from Mariah to Trustee Cyrus Swan. Mm. Will you have the goodness? to look into the observatory and see if some arrangements can be made for greater domestic comfort. The prime vertical room is an excellent summer lodging room, but is not fitted for winter. Besides being extremely cold, it is so far from my father's lodging room that in a high wind I cannot hear him if he calls to me. Will you also, for the sake of the comfort of the old gentleman, have more coal put into the observatory? He dies a thousand deaths in fearing one by freezing, and the sight of a large quantity of coal seems to keep him warm. <laughs> My dear Mr. Lawson, in 1869, I shall probably not see you this evening, as my father is not well, and I do not like to leave him. Nor do I believe I can accept your invitation for tomorrow evening, which I should much like to do, were my mind free from care about him. My dear Miss Morse, 
Father had a good night, and so I don't feel so much like taking to the dagger or the bowl or the pond as I otherwise should. Saturday, February 27th. My dear sister Sally, Father is slowly gaining. He is very much wasted, but he's cheerful now. The despondence was the worst symptom. His mind is as clear as ever. Thursday, March 4th. My dear Sally, Father seems better again today, and the doctor thinks it merely a flurry, but he is so feeble that any flurry is a serious thing. I slept in his room last night and shell whenever it is necessary. M.M. I cannot write often as I am much crowded. William Mitchell died April 19th, 1869. The professors and teachers and the 300 students gathered at the observatory and in heartfelt sorrow for the dead, they attended the carriages to the lodge. Lynn, Massachusetts, April 25th, 1869. My dear President Raymond, I am not sure I told you how long I must be away from college. If I took only the Sunday's rest, it would be possible for me to reach the observatory by Tuesday, but I feel the need for more than one day of quiet before I enter upon the new and incomprehensible life before me. July 29th, 1869. My dear President Raymond, when I left, I put into your hands a long letter. I mourn over its length, for evidently you did not read it. <laughs> But I am sorry you could not read the letter once through. I can read yours several times, even while make making wearisome computations. Will you be good enough, if you've got as far as this, to let me know if there is any hope that the college will buy me the books that I want? If not, I must beg, borrow, and buy before I return to college. I dare not repeat the brain struggle of the last year. It is suicidal to attempt to solve the problems of the universe without a knowledge of the facts and reasoning which are on record. <laughs> My dear President, I have learned only last night that Ann Arbor was looking toward you. Of course. You won't kill us outright by thinking for a moment of such a thing. You are just where you can do the maximum of good. If you should do such a horrible thing as to go, I apply now for the first vacant professorship, Greek or anything. <laughs> but you won't think of such a thing. My good-natured president, I want to hear you preach tomorrow. Uh, and I also want to see the moon pass over Aldebaran. Can't you let me do both? Will you stop at 11thly or 12thly? Oh, why need you shew us all sides of the subject? The moon never turns to us other than the one side we see. And did you ever know a finer moon? If I could stop the moon and do no more harm than Joshua did, I wouldn't ask such a favor of you, knowing, as I do, what a difficult thing it is for you to pause when you are at once started. <laughs> and know also that I never want you to do so. Except this once. <laughs> Yours, with all regret, even if it doesn't appear, M. Mitchell. 1869 letter to Charles B. Trigo, Esquire. I have your circular of October 15th, informing me of my election as the member of the American Philosophical Society of Philadelphia. 
You will please accept my thanks for the honor conferred upon me. Mariah Mitchell. From the Vassar Student Newspaper, May 1869. Some of our eager astronomers are talking of going out west to observe the total eclipse of August 7th, 1869. It seems settled that Professor Mariah Mitchell will go. Mariah writes, having no chronograph arrangement with me, I was obliged to depend on the counting of seconds by an assistant. The assistant counts aloud the half second beats of the chronometer and the observer, with an eye upon the point to be watched, and the ear intent on the assistant's voice, awaits the event. There were some seconds of breathless suspense, and then the inky blackness appeared on the burning limb of the sun. All honor to my assistant, whose uniform count on and on, with unwavering voice, steadied my nerves. That for which we had traveled 1,500 miles had really come. The Mississippi assumed a leaden hue, sickly green spread over the landscape. The neighboring cattle began to low. Birds uttered a painful cry. Fireflies twinkled in the foliage. And now it was quick work to see what could be seen, to make notes and to mark time, all in less than three minutes. The sun came forth, and nature rejoiced. And much as we needed more time, we rejoiced with nature and felt that we loved the light. Smith says, the effect of a total eclipse on the minds of men is so overpowering that if they have never seen it before, they forget their appointed tasks and will look around during the few seconds of total obscuration to witness the scene. My assistants, a party of young students, would not have turned from the narrow line of observation assigned to them if the earth had quaked beneath them. Was it because they were women? from a lecture given by Mariah Mitchell. I am far from thinking that every woman should be an astronomer or a mathematician or an artist, but I do think every woman should strive for perfection in everything she undertakes. If it be art, literature, or science, let her work be incessant, continuous, lifelong, Think of the steady effort, the continuous labor of those whom the world calls geniuses. Believe me, the poet who is born and not made works for what you consider his birthright. Are we women using all the rights we have? We have the right to steady and continuous effort after knowledge, after truth. Who denies our right to lifelong study? Yet, you'll find most women leave their studies when they leave the schoolroom. You have heard many a woman say, I was very fond of Latin when I went to school, but I've forgotten all I knew. <laughs> we have another right, which I am afraid we do not use, the right to do our work well, as well as men do theirs. I have thought of this part of the subject a good deal, and I am almost ready to say that women do their work less thoroughly than men, perhaps from the need of right training, perhaps because they enter upon occupations only temporarily. The woman who does her work better than ever woman did before helps all womankind. And this seems to me woman's greatest wrong, the wrong which she does to herself by work loosely done, ill-finished, or not finished at all. The world has not yet outgrown the idea that women are playthings because women have not outgrown it themselves. Professor Raymond, we desire your attention to the fact that after nearly five years of what we believe to be faithful working for the good of the college, 
our pay is still far below what that which has been offered at entrance to the other professors even when they have been wholly inexperienced. We respectfully ask that our salaries may be made equal to those of the other professors. Mariah Mitchell, Professor of Astronomy and Alita C. Avery, Professor of Physiology and Hygiene. July 1873, student newspaper. Professor Mitchell sailed for Europe June 28th. She will return early in the autumn. August 21st. Yesterday, I made a long journey from Basel to Cologne. A group of women joined me in my compartment. After a while, I began to talk and found they all spoke some English. I told them I had been to St. Petersburg. They were immediately interested and told me they were Russian and asked me why I had gone to St. Petersburg. I told them partly to see the city and partly to go to the observatory. They asked why I wished to see the observatory, and I told them, I had charge of one in America, that I was in a college for girls. They were at once all interest, and everyone asked a question. I asked in return, why do you ask such questions? And said, I am a woman's rights woman. Are you? And the reply was, yes, <laughs> all of us and most of the Russian women. Mm. We are from Moscow. Have you a college for girls there? No. We are always going to have one, one said with a sigh. As I left them, I begged them to study by themselves and so hold up a lesson for women. Steamer Castalia, September 12th, return trip. Uh, we are on the 13th day of our passage, and only today am I able to write. The pitchy motion which the headwinds gave is very sickening, and I was scarce able to move for seven days. I did not walk across the deck for 10 days, although I crawled up nearly every day. October 3rd, 1873. Now for college. The spirit is good and I am well heated. The observatory is all painted inside and was in perfect order when I arrived. Schoolroom floor is mended and painted. Class is large, eight advanced and 29 beginning, beginning with two more expected. January 8th, 1876. It has become a serious question with me whether it is not my duty to beg money for the observatory, while what I really long for is a quiet life of scientific speculation. I want to sit down and study on the observations made by myself and others. August 12th, 1878. To a colleague. My dear Miss Wood, a hard future is before poor Vassar. The president is failing and there is no hope. Let us work together bravely for the sake of women and try to carry the college over its stormy seas. I know of no plan, but for one year we are all pledged and must do our duty. I shall stay until all is over and then go to Lynn. M.M. -M. <clears throat> August 20th, 1878. Dr. Raymond is dead. I cannot quite take it in. I've never known the college without him and it will make all things different. Occasionally, officially, he was in his relations to the students, perfect. He was broad in his religious views. He was not broad in his ideas of women and was made to broaden the education of women by the women around him. His great weakness was his attempt at policy. It was less and less striking as he grew stronger in place. But as I look back, I plainly see that he has been timid about my position and the wisdom of keeping me a Vassar. 
I shall miss him exceedingly. I mourn for him. And it seems to me that my position will be more uncomfortable than before. From a lecture given by Mariah Mitchell. I am but a woman. For women. There are undoubtedly great difficulties in the path, but so much the more to overcome. First, no woman should say, I am but a woman, but a woman. What more can you ask to be? Born a woman, born with the average brain of humanity, born with more than the average heart, if you are mortal, with what higher destiny could you have? No matter who you are, where you are, what you are, you are a power. Your influence is incalculable. Personal influence is always underrated by the person. We are all centers of spheres. We see the portion of the sphere above us, and we see how little we affect it. We forget the part of the sphere around and beneath us. It extends just as far in every way. Another common saying is, mm, it isn't the way. Who settles the way? Is there one so forgetful of the sovereignty bestowed on her by God that she accepts a leader, one who shall carry captive her mind? Especially, do not accept society as a leader, so not accept custom as a leader. For you, there is no way except the way you make for yourselves. There is this great danger in student life. Now, we rest all upon what Socrates said or what Copernicus thought. How can we dispute established authority that has come down to us established for ages? We must at least question it. We cannot accept anything as granted beyond the first mathematical formulae. Question everything else. Eighteen eighty one, February twenty fifth. I was ill and at home in Cambridge and Nantucket from November first to January third. I had an attack of pharyngitis accompanied by noise in my ears, also a slight attack of malaria. I think I was hurt by quinine, although I took only six grains a day but it was continued for two months. At this date, February 25th, I consider myself well, but at times my ears trouble me. May 30th, 4 p.m. I've been very well all day. I think I never felt better. My cold is nearly over and I have no nervous depression. If I am to get really well, May I be enabled to work for others and not for myself. I left Vassar June 24th on the stern wheel steamer Galatia from New York to Providence. I looked out of my stateroom window and saw a strange looking body in the northern sky. I knew instantly that it was a comet and that I must return to the college. June 26th. As I could not tell it that at what time the comet would pass the meridian, I stationed myself at the telescope in the meridian room by 10 p.m., watched. As it approached the meridian, I saw that it would be behind a scraggy apple tree. I sent for the watchman, Mr. Crumb, to come with a saw and cut off the upper limbs. He came with an ax and chopped away vigorously, but as one limb and another fell, and I said, I need more cut away, he said, I think I must cut down the whole tree. And I said, cut it down. <laughs> I felt the barbarism of it, but I felt most that a bird might have a nest in it. May 7th, 1882. I had a few minutes of seeming to be deaf in class. 
It would not trouble me if it had not set my heart to beating and my fingers for perhaps a minute. It felt bad. I put my hands into warm water and it was immediately over. This is the only illness I have had of five minutes duration in four months. I had eaten some very peppery hash. This is just a year since a similar ill turn a year ago. May 20th, 1882. Vassar is getting pretty. I gathered lilies of the valley this morning. The young robins are out in a tree close by us, and the Phoebe has built, as usual, under the front steps. I am rushing dome poetry, but so far show no alarming symptoms of brilliancy. January 12th, 1886. Letter to Professor Mariah Mitchell. The Boston Association of Vassar Alumni feels deeply the need of an endowment for the astronomical department at Vassar College. And having heard that you were willing to try to raise the amount necessary for such an endowment, they offer you the sum of $500 to cover any expenses which you may incur in traveling. The alumni wish to express their appreciation of your readiness to undertake this work. August 22nd, 1886. I have given myself over to mammon, meaning am begging for the observatory of Vassar and am pulling wires. I have taken about $2,700. Add a zero, and I will have done with such work forever. But I've had a good time, seen lots of nice people whom it would have been a pity not to know, and am ready to ask, where are the vulgar rich? <laughs> For my rich are as elegant and courteous as can be found in the old Sir Charles Granderson novels. July 16th, 1887. The students used to say that my way of teaching was that of the man who said to his son, there are the letters of the English language, go into that corner and learn them. <laughs> it is not exactly my way, but I do think as a general rule, teachers talk too much. Do let them occasionally listen. A book is a good institution to read a book, to think it over and to write out notes is a useful exercise. The fashion of lecturing is becoming a rage and a fashion. The teacher shows off herself. She does not enough try to develop her pupil. The greatest object in education is to give you a right habit of study, especially the teacher should not show off herself. For once, let her forget herself. December 21st, 1887. I have worked a long time on three formulae. Page 88 of Loomis's algebra, the easiest algebra I ever knew. Continually, I mistook figures. <clears throat> Possibly my glasses are too weak. January 8th, 1888. President Taylor. Dear sir, you are probably somewhat prepared for the announcement of my resignation of the professorship of Vassar. I had much hoped to continue until June, but my more than half century of work has worn and tired me. My physicians advise rest. Vassar College, President's Office, January 9th, 1888. My dear Miss Mitchell, your letter embodying your resignation reached me today. Had I been told yesterday that such an event was imminent, I should not have believed it. 
Of course, I knew that you often thought of it, but it has come unexpectedly, undesired, and I would add unwelcomed, did I not think that your judgment is probably founded on recent experiences that have demanded your action with a view of gaining the rest needed to prolong your life and usefulness. I shall favor a proposition making you Professor Emeritus for life. And you may be sure that we shall be glad to do all we can to honor one whose faithful service and whose honesty of heart and life have been among the chief inspirations of Vassar College throughout its history. <laughs> of public reputation, you have doubtless had enough. But I am sure you cannot have too much of the affection and esteem which we feel towards you who have had the privilege of working with you. Sincerely yours, James M. Taylor. Lynn, Massachusetts, March, 1888. I am at present as much worn with setting up my room and a half as I would be with college work. I want for the spring days to set up my own little observatory and play work perhaps a little longer. That is, I shall try to do some little work. I was only tired, but oh, so tired. I meant anyway to leave in June, and I wanted to reach June. My dear Mrs. Raymond, I thank you very much for your letter. I feel as if I had met a bereavement. I left because I thought it was time, and I have rejoiced in it every moment. But as I knew I should, I feel the dropping down of occupation. I am not really ill, but feeble and listless. I walk a good deal and have put up my small observatory as I did nearly 30 years ago. I shall try to do some work. I seem to lack strength. My dear Miss Wood, you are very good not to notice me. My friends have been very considerate, absent ones. Present friends declare that I am a perfect bore and I talk of myself only. I still hope to come back to college. I shall not come back until I feel that it is safe. My mind has rested since I sent Mary Whitney off. She is the most powerful rival that I could put in my place. May she surpass me, her teacher, and that by many times. But I leave the future and try to live only one day at a time. M. -M. Mariah Mitchell died June 28, 1889. In the Wind by Mariah Mitchell. I let the wild wind whistle and pass. I shut my eyes to the frost on the pane. I shut my ears to the creaking vein. I shut my thoughts from the past and its pain. I think of the girls, soon women to be, who daily bring joy and peace to me, who watch the bear whirl round in his lair, who get up too soon to look at the moon, who go somewhat mad on the last pleiad, who try to seek on the sword of Orion, who, lifting their hearts to the heavenly blue, will do woman's work for the good and the true, and as sisters or daughters or mothers, or wives will take the starlight into their lives.
all for her name is Andrea Gallows, the actor. Mm -hmm. She's wonderful. Thank you all for being here. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, so we have some sweets and some uh, soda outside. You're welcome to uh, join us for a little bit and spend a little time with uh, Andrea. And uh, also say that um, we have some glasses there that are um, that are commemorative glasses of the 200th birthday anniversary of Mariah Mitchell. And you're welcome to drink out of it and then take it home with you. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.